<laughs> Hi, uh, good afternoon. Thanks for coming in for your uh, third grade reading of Operation Security and Deception. Uh, my name is Greg Carpenter. And just a little bit up front, op, op, OPSEC and Deception, they have a lot to do with each other. They're two of what we call the five pillars of information warfare, information operations. The other three being uh, cyber operations, electronic warfare, and then of course you have um, PSYOP. Thank you. I pulled a blank on PSYOP. Of all things, my goodness. So, real quick agenda here. Uh, you're going to see a lot of things and you're going to say, okay, that's right, that's wrong. And we're going to challenge your biases and your belief system today just a little bit with uh, nuanceable things around the slides. So, who am I? I'm Greg. Uh, I'm a recovering signals intelligence guy from NSA. Uh, and I get paid to say that now because I was outed on WikiLeaks and they told my life story. And so you get me for who I am. Uh, I did seven years up at NSA, uh, 27 years in the Army. I uh, ran a counterintelligence office, uh, cyber operations. I worked at the National Cyber Investigative Joint Task Force with the FBI, and a whole bunch of other boring things that I'm not going to throw at you right now. But one of the most important aspects of deception and OPSEC revolve around what William Casey, the former CIA director, said in 1981 with his first meeting with Ronald Reagan when he took over in uh, the White House. He said, we'll know our disinformation program is complete when everything the American public believes is false. And that's a powerful statement, especially from someone who is running the Central Intelligence Agency for our folks who wants to make sure that everything you believe and understand and know is a lie. So take that in perspective for just one second and think about all of the other intelligence agencies around the world and what they could possibly be doing or what they may not be doing. Now because I said that I am a, a dirty NSA guy, I have to give you my standard disclaimer written by those people. And it's in here somewhere that it says that everything that I say uh, is my idea. It's not NSA's idea. It's not anybody else's concern. And I took the liberty of taking everything that I did today and because of the theme, I made it say what NSA meant for it to say using Dr. Seuss. NSA says, there's no way I say all the words I'd like to say today. They said to say what should be said would land me in a cold, dark bed. They say I must share with care. I can't just share most anywhere. I try to say what they said should be said, but I was told this should be read. I'll read this now and you will see how this piece bores the heck out of you and me. My ideas and thoughts that I present today are not that of the National Security Agency, the Central Security Service, and do not represent that of the United States government. See? Boring. All right, so with that, we're going to move right on into the first subject, and that is a little talk about OPSEC. So with OPSEC, we're going to start with a very, very well-known uh, story, and that's going to be the Battle of Trenton, which commenced 26 September. No, no corrections? Okay, 26 December. Yeah, that's better. Okay. 26 December. George Washington took off on the night of the 25th with his troops, hit the Delaware River, moved out smartly. He got over just outside of Trenton, New Jersey, and they had 2,400 troops. Now they started with 5,000, and two battalions didn't make it. So he showed up 
for war with only 48% of his troops to start. However, the good part was that he had been feeding misinformation through some of the traitors and the people working with the German Hessians in the area, and they believed that there was no imminent threat. Now, the colonel in charge, Johann Riel, believed that, well, I think something could be happening. I think we could have something going on here. But he was overwhelmed with just a ton of information about absolutely nothing happening. Now, the Hessians had settled in, and uh, James, Mon uh, excuse me, James Madison said himself that, you know, they certainly do take Christmas upon themselves. They had a double helping of rum. They were relaxed. They weren't looking for anything. The Delaware was, let's just say it was very cold. It started as rain. It turned to sleet, turned to snow and ice. Washington's troops, barely half of them had shoes. They had to trek miles. Trenton, New Jersey didn't have fortifications. And the Hessians were a little concerned about that. So they put some outposts out. They didn't know that Washington and his guys showed up until the outposts let them know that the Continentals were upon them. The operational security controls put in place by George Washington and the colonels were complete and total. It's hard enough to move troops. Anybody who's been in the military knows that from point A to point B. But to get them into boats, to have guys fall overboard, and to only lose two people to exposure in a walk through snow and ice, and show up with 48% of your troops and take the garrison. And it took them only 45 minutes to completely control the Hessians. The number of Hessians that were captured is listed at upwards of around 900 out of a garrison of 1,500. The Continentals lost two to exposure, five wounded in battle. Among them was uh, future President James Madison, who had an artery severed. The Hessians had 22 killed, 83 wounded, and 900 captured. So basically, out of 1,500, Washington had taken 1,000. Not a small deal. Not a small deal indeed. But because of the theme of what we did, I changed George Washington's quote into a Dr. Seuss quote. And I think it's very appropriate. This is exactly what George Washington would have said if he had read Dr. Seuss books in that time period. Uh, does anybody know what the flag is on the bottom of the slide there, just by chance? Anybody? OK. This is the Grand Union flag, first flag commissioned. And Washington wrote under this flag before any other. It was first used in 1775 and decommissioned with the Flag Act of June 14, 1777. Fast forward a week or two to 1966, and the military was engaged again in Vietnam. A huge attack had taken place. And President Johnson, let's just say he was not happy. And he said, we have to launch a massive counterattack and let them know that we're serious. So we did that. And you might know it by the name Rolling Thunder and Arc Light. One was carpet bombing in North Vietnam. And the other was in South Vietnam. Now that we came to find out later on that that included uh, Lao PDR, Cambodia, and some other places. But our efforts put millions, hundreds of millions of dollars of bombs into knocking out the North Vietnamese army. 
and the Viet Cong. And is anybody familiar with the purple dragon analysis other than anybody who's worked in information warfare? I'm not going to call out names. All right. So the name of the program was called Purple Dragon. And it was a wake-up call because the bombing runs weren't working. The casualties in North Vietnam were almost nothing. We were taking B-52s from Guam and other bases in the Philippines and we were dropping each time about 17 million dollars worth of bombs and our net gain was zero. So Purple Dragon was commissioned to figure out what the heck was going on. Why didn't we have any success? And NSA did an analysis, and mostly, uh, this is what you can see they figured out, is that, I'll read it for the folks in the back, the dragon's purple and we can say he wouldn't like to be that way. This is sad, it cannot be. Our OPSEC's bad, but don't cry like me. The operation security around Rolling Thunder and Arclight were terrible, terrible. There were people who were working out on the tarmac who were Viet Cong. They were passing information about the movement of the planes. The logistics people who were bringing the bombs in to get them loaded in the Philippines and in Guam and other places were also spies, giving away valuable, unclassified information. Now, as with the previous one, anytime you see something that's been redacted by the government, it tells a story inside of a story inside of a story. And what's released sometimes is interesting. So I'm going to show you a bunch of other redacted documents where the FBI, the CIA, and the NSA have removed information from the documents. But keep in mind, it protects their equities on, so, good. So uh, the Purple Dragon, and the reason we're showing Purple Dragon here is they, dis they figured out that the lessons apply to the civilian cryptologic profession as well, which is all about the type of stuff that we do. In Purple Dragon, the tarmac was compromised, the supply chain was compromised, implementation was compromised, and the operation itself in total was compromised. And why do I say that? I say that because when our planes went up, they went from one airspace to another, to another. And anytime you fly a plane, what do you have to file? Got to have a flight plan. Well, flight plans aren't classified. Flight plans you share with every single activity from where you started to where you're going to get to. And it, everywhere along the route, in your primary and your secondary route. Everybody in Southeast Asia knew eight hours before they were bombed that they were going to get bombed. Because we basically, you know the, not my monkey, not my circus? Okay, well we own the monkeys, we own the circus, and we had just knocked down the tallest pole in the tent on ourselves. It was a mess. We had no control over the operation that had the highest levels of security. If you can see the classification markings on this thing that they have, and this will be, again, like everybody else's, this is available. Um, I have the full Purple Dragon uh, declassified version that goes along with this. And you can have that and look through the whole thing yourself and just kind of go like this, like, oh my God. But this type of stuff, the supply chain is compromised. Where have I heard that before? Every, all of our manufacturers are compromised. 
Where have I heard that before? Our whole operation's compromised. Our sock is compromised. It kind of sounds like cyber operations today. Anything that we do to try to defend our equities. At the end of Purple Dragon, controls were put into place. As you can see, the controls that are shareable with the public are up here. That's what they did to fix the problem. You get to know that part. In the center, they mentioned that the North Vietnamese stations had alerted only 34% as opposed to 98%. And the average time went from eight and a half hours of notice down to less than 30 minutes. Increasing casualties and uh, battle damage uh, by roughly 1,700%. Putting new controls of operation security into place completely changed the aspect of what was happening in both operations. So, let's have a little talk about deception. Now, the first thing you have to be aware of is that here, in Iowa, I thought I would include some very important information on bovine deception. How to sneak up on a cow and not be seen. That's important. And I'll just share with you a little story. On my first trip to Montreal as a kid, I have family that lives in Laval, just outside of Montreal. And I'd always heard, kid from Brooklyn, right? I always heard about this thing called cow tipping. Extremely intriguing to a guy from Brooklyn like me. And we got just over the border in Canada, and my cousin and I, we saw a farm, and there, <clears throat> you guys will get this, all by itself in a field was one cow. And there was a bunch of cows over there on the other side of the road, but over here I said, I can take that one cow over there. I got this guy. And of course, I hopped, don't shake your head, I'm not done yet. So I, <laughs> I get up, I hop the fence and I go plowing into this thing and hit it as hard as I can. I thought my teeth would fall out. As you know the answer to the story here on what happened and how fast I learned that I could really run, it was not a cow, right? It happened to be a bull and the bull was not happy with me, probably more than I wasn't happy with him being a bull. Um, but. I went along with his little game that he was playing, pretending to be a cow, and I moved my butt on the other side of the fence as fast as I could. Now, that was about 250 yards I had to run. Uh, and me being of stout Irish composition, um, I'm not designed for that high performance activity, but I made it. So I learned a lot more about bovine deception and how to learn to sneak up on a cow, but more importantly, um, to ensure that a cow really is a cow. I think that's the critical information, and that's the one thing that we want protected with OPSEC. We want to protect the critical information. With deception, we want to proliferate and make all kinds of similarities so you think you have that critical information in one or more or many other places. So let's go back to Trenton. George, so there was more than one part of the Trenton campaign. Okay, there was Trenton part one and then Trenton part two. In Trenton part two, uh, Washington had found out that the rest of the troops didn't get across the river. So he wasn't what we call happy. And he realized that he had to pull all of his folks back out of Trenton and head across to Delaware again because his flank was exposed. If your flank's exposed in the military, you can get rolled real easily. And end of game, end of revolution, we're done. So, oh. And one other interesting point, remember how I mentioned before that you know, the Hessians had a 
double dose of rum and they were happy kicking back. Well, John Greenwood, one of the patriots uh, who was on the campaign, who took control of a significant group of prisoners, said this. He said, quote, I am certain not a drop of liquor was drunk during the whole night, nor, as I could see, even a piece of bread eaten. Directly conflicting with the storyline that we've been told since we were kids. We went to school. We learned that the Hessians were drunk that night. They were no match for George Washington and the Continentals. This guy was an eyewitness. He was there. He was in charge of 200 prisoners, and not a drop of alcohol did he smell on them, nor did he find any empty bottles of rum when they rounded him up. Just a point of interest. So, anyway, back to part two of Trenton. Washington had gone back across to Delaware, but he knew he had to come back. So he organized for his guys to come back across the other side. And they met again with the British at the Battle of Assenpunk Creek. Now, anybody ever been there by chance? No? Okay. The reason I chose the picture for this, by the way, does anybody know the name of the picture? You guys are great, by the way. I mean, this is, this is called George Washington at Trenton. <laughs> Go figure. So, but the important part here is that you don't read in the books. Let me come over to this side. See how we're doing this like this, like this way, looking this way? Over here is Assenpunk Creek. And he's looking towards the, the creek itself. In that way, they captured both aspects of the battle. Brilliant, brilliant. But anyway, so Washington gets out there and he finds himself that night, December 30th, that he had gotten in and they, they had started to put in a bivouac. And they had some delaying moves because the British were closing in on them. As evening fell, Cornwallis said, okay, we're not gonna be able to get them tonight. It's too dark. And back then you didn't fight at nighttime, right? That was uh, ungentlemanly. So Washington called a council of war. He said, what are we gonna do? I think I need to go to Princeton and we're gonna take those guys out over there because that's my big plan. And the general sat around there with him, we're like, yeah, that's a good idea, George. You're done good. But how are we going to get to Princeton? And Washington said, no problem. It's in the bag, essentially. He moved about three quarters of the troops, then he moved another 20% of the troops. And he left behind 500 guys with a really crazy artillery colonel called Henry Knox. And Henry Knox kept lobbing rounds into the British garrison all night long. That was very ungentlemanly of him. He probably received a letter of reprimand from the king, I'm sure. But he kept the British awake all night and annoyed. They couldn't form lines, they couldn't attack. It was dark, nobody did that. Cornwallis said, He's pinned up against the water. We got him. He's not going anywhere. I got him in the morning. Well, they had lit bonfires. There were pioneering tools left back there. The guys that were left in the bivouac area were chink, 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 taken away, playing out a deception story that they were digging in trenches for a British attack. All night long, they heard the shovels, the picks. They saw the fires. They were getting harassed by the artillery. One would think you expected to see Washington and 3,000 troops dug in in the morning. When Cornwallis got up, had his geritol, stepped out there, looked out there, and he did a Looney Tunes double take. There was nobody there. Washington was gone 20 miles down the road. He had started the movement about 2 a.m. And under the cover of noise, the British didn't hear anything. He took him across another river. He did, ergo the name, 
the old fox, which was George Washington's nickname. And Cornwallis should have expected this because in the Battle of Long Island, just the summer before, Washington was pinned against the East River. And if you're not from, how many New Yorkers are here? All right, how you doing? How you doing? All right, good. So, wait, city or upstate? Get out of here. Brooklyn. Brooklyn. All right, there, I'm talking to you. So, <laughs> so what happened? Um, Washington was pinned against the East River. You could see Manhattan, you couldn't get there. And it was right where Queens and Brooklyn met. And the British had him completely surrounded with like 8,000 soldiers. And Washington had nowhere to go. And he said it was the intervention of the divine himself. They started doing the same thing. A fog had set in early that evening. Very uncharacteristic for that time of year. And the fog gave them just enough cover that he took out the shovels and the pickaxes and the fires. And they did the same exact thing that he did to Cornwallis here. He did to Howe over there. Cornwallis knew what he had done to Howe, but he didn't think it could happen to him because he was Lord Cornwallis. He fell for the same deception. You fall for a deception once, okay, shame on you. You fall for the same thing twice, okay. Probably time to hang up your stars. So, because we're talking about deception, you have to include the obligatory Sun Tzu memes. There they are. Revel in them, enjoy them. Uh, but of course, Sun Tzu's uh, lesser known cousin, Clausewitz, uh, must also be included. So you don't want to forget him. Thank God he's got a cup of coffee. So like I was saying, people are stupid. They will let their biases, their personal arrogance, and many other behaviors decide what they're going to do. It will drive their actions. And in any good deception, you can absolutely use their biases against them and lead them down the path of where they think that they want to take you. So let's talk about deception itself just for a minute. The principles here, focus, objective, centralized planning, security, timeliness, and integration. Focus, I want to affect one person who's going to make a decision. The objective is to make them make a decision that's going to help you do what you want to do. Centralized planning, I'm going to talk about that in a little bit because centralized planning is a thing that kills people all the time in a deception. Basically, you want to coordinate and synchronize what the heck you're doing. If you don't, it could be a bad day for everybody. Security, the interesting aspect here is security. We're talking about operations security along with higher level securities. Not just, uh, not just leaving unclassified or unimportant non-critical information out by itself. Timeliness. So I would add timeliness and location, location, location. You gotta hit the right server, you gotta hit there at the right time, you gotta do the right things. And integration, come at them from more than one angle. The OPSEC process, this is what we learned from Purple Dragon. If you don't know what your important information is, you don't know what you're protecting and you won't know how to protect it. If you don't know who the bad guy is, you don't know what they do or how they do it. And if you don't know those two things, you have no idea what your vulnerabilities are and you cannot understand your risk. After you take and analyze, you look at the countermeasures that you can put in place to reduce your residual risk. So, OPSEC basically denies critical information and activities. Deception, 
confuses that information that's out there. You can have what's called ambiguity increasing or ambiguity decreasing. One or the other. One focuses people's looks one way, one takes and makes them go, oh my God, what the heck am I looking at? This is so similar to this, to this, to this. Anybody ever work with this thing called Microsoft Word? And you create this thing called a document, right? And then you're, you're happy, you got everything done, and you love what you did. And then your boss says, hey, I want to take a look at that. You want to look at that? No, it's, I finished it, it's done. I want to take a look at it, I want to see. And then your boss takes a look at it. And what does your boss do? He changes stuff. Does he change the name of the document? Sometimes. Do you know what he changed? Never, because it's your boss. Then he says, well, throw that back out to the team and have the team look at it. So about three iterations or four iterations of this, what do you have? Good God, you have 20 different copies of the document that you made, and because you're the author, because that's what it says in the metadata, you have no idea who the last person was to work on the important copy of the one that you wanted to push back forward to the committee for decision so they could allocate $500 million to a project that you were supposed to run. This is the nightmare. So ambiguity increasing. We're good at doing it to ourselves too. So some of the things that are important to have is operation security review of a deception plan and a critical deception analysis of an OPSEC plan. Because they play and they integrate with each other so closely, each team should be evaluating each other's plan, or you should evaluate if you're working on both of them. You should look at both aspects of it. Make sure you take off the hat. My boss likes to say, Greg, you're the guy with lots of hats and no hat rack. I'm going to buy you a hat rack because you got to look at things different sometimes and I'm just as bad as anybody else. I'll st keep looking at it like this and I should be taking a different aspect, a different look at something. So uh, interdependencies and oh yeah, back to Washington again. So uh, I took liberties at translating what George Washington said this time a um, little bit. Um, but basically that captures the emotion that he had because about two miles outside of town on his way into Trenton, all three main columns that he had reunited. They all got back together. And then Washington was startled. Out of nowhere came these 50 guys, militia guys, led by a guy named Adam Stephen. And they had no idea about Washington's plan of attack of Trenton. None whatsoever. He said, oh yeah, we were just down there harassing the Hessians. We got them all pissed off. They're really annoyed right now. <laughs> and that's when Washington said this with this language, because he was consummately a nice guy about it. Uh, but Adam Stephen almost completely destroyed Washington's plan of attacking Trenton, single-handedly because it wasn't a coordinated attack. One hand didn't know what the other was doing. And this is something that we do quite often. So talking to people and making sure that we have everything synchronized is a key component in a successful operation security deception plan. So we're gonna talk a little about this theoretical case study So Chinese is a great place to start because we call these target markets. In these areas, you can see the different combination of written and spoken Chinese. Each is unique except in mainland China and in Singapore where they're the same. Now there's a big section in mainland China uh, down in Guangzhou that speak Cantonese. That is, that includes the town of Canton, China. 
where Cantonese comes from. And that has a few hundred million people, not a significant number in China, but significant enough to make it the, the behind Mandarin, the most spoken language in China. So that's the only exception to this policy. So if I'm looking at this matrix here, keep in mind that the written language and the spoken language is not the same. Unlike English, you can talk to someone from England, you'll have a hard time. I mean, you heard Chris Roberts earlier from the UK. Good God, okay, I needed a translator, I get it. Okay, but you can work through with what he's saying. So we're gonna go one level deeper into the types of characters that are used so I can frame this case study for you. The different types of characters that are used are not all the same ones that are used in each language. For example, phonosemantic characters make up about 80% of the language. 80%. And that is both in simplified and traditional. However, pictograms like a character that means mountain, sun, house, things like that. Less than 5% in both. But these are all different. So the style of writing is different also. So between countries, between China and Singapore, for example, you use simplified. However, the style of writing is different. People in New York write differently than people in the UK or in Alabama or, or California. So the style of writing is extremely important too. So in my theoretical case, I have a situation. I have a company that wants some software delivered. And I have a, another company that's going to provide that as a subcontractor and as a provider. I have a team that are primary German language speakers. Let's just say they're from Germany or Austria, just for the heck of it. Their first language is German, not Chinese. But now they have a target where they want to influence and their objective is to influence somebody over there. So they're writing the software. Where do you think you could drop something or leave something that's gonna be read by somebody who's gonna be integrating, they're gonna be testing and integrating that software into your products? In the comments. So, I'm gonna take my Chinese characters and leave them as developer notes and ideas in the comments. Now, on the other side, when that, get, when that product gets received, you have a situation where these guys wrote it and maybe they're trying to help the company. So they left some notes in there that seemed like they were legitimate. Now, do you take action on that? Does the company have an operational security review? Do they do tests and evaluation before they integrate that into their system? Does that change? that they want the other company to make, does that circumvent some of their security practices? What if they're just trying to get those guys to do a change so that somebody else will see them do it? Think back during the Cold War for a minute. There were times where we had these things called proxy wars and it wouldn't be the US and it wouldn't be Russia involved in a war, but there was a couple other countries involved. And we funded one side and the Soviets funded the other side and we had these guys fight it out. Well, in that proxy war, there were things that we identified as observables. We wanted certain things to happen in that proxy war that would make the Russians go, oh, wait a minute, they have that technology. Hmm. They didn't show us that before. They didn't talk about it. We thought that they were in the Stone Age. 
but what we showed them maybe didn't work. Maybe it was just something we wanted them to see that didn't work. Recently we just saw some demonstration of hypersonic vehicles. Who knew that anybody had that technology up and running? We didn't see it coming. We thought it was another 10 years off or so. Is that really what happened? Did those vehicles really go up in the air? Did, did Kim Jong-un really fly missiles that worked? And probably not, no. You know, it's, it, most of his stuff doesn't work anyway. So we end up spending a lot of time doing these things that are very complicated. And we make it so complicated that we confuse ourselves and our security protocols fail because we've done so much and we don't know what the end state is and what the goal is. Think that, for example, how effective is antivirus? Best case scenario. About what, 30% maybe? Something like that? I'm being generous, okay? There was a case not that long ago a well-known antivirus company, call it Greg Carpenter's antivirus company. They went and they were able to detect these really strange pieces of malware that nobody else could figure out. Nobody knew where they came from or how they were put together or how they worked. It was just a mystery. And then through a little work, other companies had gotten them and they what we'd like to use. So uh, I used to work in the uh, Joint Task Force for Global Network Operations, and we had in the back, we had an office called Unpimp Your Botnet. And back there you would take and reverse engineer all the botnets. So we took this piece of software that came from Greg Carpenter Antivirus Company, and we'd, we'd take a look at it, and we come to find out that it was actually Greg Carpenter's antivirus company that actually created the virus and put it into the environment in the first place. It's all about making money, right? <laughs> so that's more common than you might actually think. So always, always, always be optimistic about what you can do. Um, like I said, people People are stupid. People will fall for anything in the world. Yeah, you got the Monty Python line. Good. Okay. Yeah, people will fall for anything. Like I said, I worked at NSA for years. The stupid things that happen, everybody who, who really likes to have their phones juiced, I'm, they'll, every time, they'll just go up there and drop it, and they will get it taken over every single time. Be optimistic, but don't be overconfident. Two days ago, we just had this little beauty dropped on us. I don't know if you've read this or not, but basically the CIA put out and used for a period of about 14 years a whole bunch of covert sites, 885 sites, where they were communicating with their covert assets all over the world. And they could have been cracked by a human speed bump. I'm paraphrasing again. It could have been cracked by somebody with little to no skill whatsoever. Now, I remember back in the day when I was at NSA and we had the big computer hacker fight, like all well, the hackers, they wanted to go to the CIA, they wanted to go to the NSA, the back and forth, all it. They don't know what team they wanted to play on. And we were told that the CIA won that fight. And I look at something like this and I think to myself, my gosh, I don't really think you won that fight. You think you're so good that your own personal biases led you to believe something that's not true. And you failed. And what happened? More than two dozen sources in China were killed. More people in Iran were killed and several other countries. We lost a whole bunch of people. I'm sure someone got a promotion and transferred. So, in short, don't be angry, don't be mad about it, 
take on a positive aspect of life, take on a positive aspect that you can make a difference. Using programs like OPSEC the way it should be done, there, there are great books out there on OPSEC and network deception, and it's not all about us. <clears throat> There's children here. Um, it's not all about a honeypot, okay? Get over it. There are lots of things that you can do out there that don't involve a honeypot. So think differently. Be comfortable in the noise. Work through the noise, work with the noise. Let that guide what you do. One thing that works really well is reminding people their place in the world, okay? And when you do that, don't take a picture, Abby, because I'm going to tell you right now, there's a reason I use this. Does anybody know what the problem with this is? No? You can't see it too well. Let's count the planets from the sun. One, two, three, four. You're on Mars, pal. So feeding people disinformation or misinformation and affecting how they think about themselves is an extremely powerful tool, more powerful than a honeypot. And my personal thought on this is that there's no way I mean, there is, my Buford T. Justice voice would come out, not as good as Abby's Terminator voice, but there is no way that there enough money is going to be printed to solve the cyber problem. Because too many people have too much money to make in this game. And it's going to be around for a very long time, so you might as well get used to it. But the best thing that you could do is be a helper and not a hinderer. Put yourself in a position where you can use programs, OPSEC, deception programs. Don't get stuck in the risk management framework. 800 and how many pages? Oh my God, did you ever try to take that to a medium or small size company and say, here, the risk management framework is gonna secure your network, I guarantee you. Every government agency, every government agency that has ever been hacked was FIPS compliant. They had an SSP. They used the risk management framework. They used all that stuff. But every single one of them has been hacked. Or they don't know that they've been hacked yet. So, a susical conclusion. OPSIC is good and deception ain't bad. If we use both together, we'll be oh so glad. And I will let it go off to anybody who dares to ask a question. It has to be in the form, of course, it has to be in the form of a question, not an answer. And it has to be spoken in Dr. Seuss language, if you have a question. Now, I wouldn't be that bold either. So with that, I say thank you very much for having me here at CornCon. Thank you.